Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Welcome back to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and Family Talk is the listener-supported broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Today on Family Talk, we're going to share the second installment of a special interview that Dr. Dobson conducted with his friend, Dr. Jay Kessler. This conversation has never been heard on Family Talk before, and Dr. Dobson specifically requested that we share it on this program today. He and Dr. Kessler will be discussing grandparents and their vital importance to the institution of the family and to culture. In God's design for the family, grandparents hold a special, much-needed role. Now, before we get right into the program, though, let me introduce you to Dr. Dobson's guest today. Dr. Jay Kessler is the former president and chancellor of Taylor University in Upland, Indiana. He graduated from Taylor in 1958 and is best known for his writings and radio work. He has served as preaching pastor of Upland Community Church, was president of Youth for Christ from 1973 to 1985, and was president of Taylor University from 1985 until 2000. Dr. Jay Kessler is also the author of nearly 30 books, including the popular titles, 10 Mistakes Parents Make with Teenagers, and Being Holy, Being Human, Dealing with the Expectations of Ministry. On today's broadcast, Dr. Dobson and Dr. Kessler will continue their talk about the unique and powerful influence that grandparents can have in a child's life. They'll also tackle the topic of aging with grace and dignity and being a consistent landmark that your grandchild can always rely on. Let's go to that conversation right now on today's edition of Family Talk. Jay, your book, Grandparenting the Agony and the Ecstasy, deals with these practical things we're talking about. Let's focus on some of the suggestions and recommendations in this book. Uh, First of all, I'd like to know the background to it, because it's my understanding that uh, a survey of a thousand grandparents was done, or a thousand people uh, in in, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana? (laughs) Yeah, we had a conference, a family conference, primarily women's conference, and um, I told the women that I was going to uh, try to do a book on grandparenting, and I'd like for them to dredge up out of their experience uh, uh, what their grandparents had contributed as significant others in their life. And I was amazed when I got the mail back how powerfully grandparents had affected the value system of these people. In fact, grandparents were in some ways more important to them than, than parents, and so I uh, collected a lot of this stuff, and, and it was uh, very helpful to write off of this in uh, Mm -hmm. the grandparenting thing. Well, tell us what several things grandparents should be trying to accomplish with their grandkids. Well, I talk about growing pains, for instance, the fact that kids grow up pretty insecure. You know, will I ever become a pretty young lady? Uh, Will I ever be a, a manly man? Well, I talk about the importance of grandparents affirming these things over and over in this survey. The people said, my grandma or my grandpa is the only person who ever really believed in me. They always said, yes, you can do it. Go ahead and try it. You can do it. You can, you, mm. You're going to be something. You're going to amount to something. And uh, I searched for the reason, and I guess it was just that they felt, well, if they're that old and they think so and they made it, then I guess maybe I can. But I'm encouraging grandparents here to, to do a lot of this affirmation of kids, that they, they need the assurance that, yes, if you've lived a long time, yes, you will find a husband. Uh, yes, you will be able to go to college. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. pass. I did. That mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Grandparents did a lot of that stuff. Uh, people have a lot of common sense, really. But the literature, I think, is making people uh, are afraid to do things. Uh, uh, this has been true. Jim, your, your book, Dare to Discipline. I mean, who thought we shouldn't? You know, I mean, doesn't yeah. everybody, why, you know, why do you have to make, why, a, case you have to make a case? But you did. Yeah. You, the book became a, a national bestseller and became a, a real uh, problem to a lot of uh, people with modern social theory because someone said dare to discipline. Well, basically, you didn't teach people how to discipline. You affirmed something they already knew. They also play a role in encouraging parents, don't they? Sure. In, in saying, now, don't look too quickly for the person your child is going to be. This yeah. is really going to turn out all right. This don't is, count this the score is, at halftime. That's <laughs> right. This is, a, this is a phase. This is going to pass. And uh, to remind the parent that they went through this. You know, a lot of times parents have selective memory, too. 
uh, you know, the thing that makes the good old days the good old days is a poor memory, sort of. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, grandparents can kind of remind their own children, hey, remember when you were going through this struggle? You know, when you were 17, uh, remember that boy that you fell in love with and I yeah. didn't really think he was the right kind of boy and so on, and we argued and you pouted and... Well, that's what she's going through. Back off. It'll be all right. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important role of grandparenting. Not hands-on, but affirmation, cheerleading, on the edge, assurance, affirming, this kind mm. of role. What role do grandparents play in second-guessing parents? Mm -hmm. uh, how far do they go in saying, you're making a mistake there? You know, that's really, you're being too harsh, or you're being too permissive. Uh, what advice do you have for grandparents? Well, I've suggested in this book that that be done very carefully, you know, lest they drive a wedge. And yet there is a time, I think, when serious things are happening to take a son or daughter of your own aside, uh, away from their own uh, spouse, and in a, a quiet atmosphere simply say, I've been observing this, I'm concerned about it, uh, I'm sure you have your reasons, but here's something I'm observing. And I, I found in this survey that a great many parents felt they'd been helped that way. But on the other hand, this is it's kind of like, you and I are fishermen, so I use <laughs> fishermen's metaphor, but if you've uh, got a 10-pound bass on and you know you got a three-pound line, you handle them in a certain way. If you've got a 10-pound bass on, you've got some piece of wire you, know, you fish with out in the ocean, you can horse him in the boat. I think the thing I'm saying to grandparents is you always sense I've got a 10-pounder on here with a three-pound line, and you do this very carefully. Yeah, it takes yeah. skill. You, you can't horse them in the boat, or they'll simply just feel you're interfering. Mom and dad uh, don't know, and so on. And a very good tough. memory crutch for me is A, but not O. Yeah. Advice, but not ownership. Yeah. Yeah. You say, this is what I would do. I think you're, yeah. you're uh, making a mistake here. There might be a better way to do this. But it's your child, and if you don't choose to take my advice, I accept that because I had my day, and this is yours, and you don't try to force it. Uh, you know, there's a whole different attitude there. Was, there. there was one universal that ran through the whole survey that I found absolutely fascinating, humorous, and Janie and I had to confess it's ours too, and it was that universally grandparents agree that grandchildren obey better when the parents aren't around, when they're in the grandparents' yeah. home and the parents aren't around, <laughs> the kids do real well. As soon as the parents walk in the door, the dynamic changes and the kids start misbehaving and so on. And we struggle with this quite a bit. I talked to quite a lot of parents about this. And the conclusion was that many of them felt that they could not be themselves around their own parents. They, they were so anxious to be the best parent in the world that whenever they were in their parents' house, first of all, they'd drive up in front of the house and warn the children, now we're going to grandma's house, I want you to behave, you know? And, and everybody was up there, it's like, it's like standing ready to make a free throw and someone yeah. calls time out, you know, to, to ice them, you know? And they're iced when they come in like that. And so uh, I suggest off of that, we can learn a real lesson. And that is to, uh, in the uh, home, when the parents are there, it's the parents' problem, not your own, you know? Back mm -hmm. away and let the parents uh, do, the, do the discipline. Two people can't do it because kids catch on to this very, very quickly. Oh, boy, they'll play one against the other, Absolutely. won't they? Yeah. Yeah. You know, my uh, own mother had tremendous wisdom with regard to children. I've said that many times. And uh, a good part of Dare to Discipline came from what I saw her model and the way she approached discipline. She became a grandmother and forgot everything she knew. Yeah. I mean, my daughter and son could just get away with an awful lot there, and I wanted her to toughen up because I remembered how she used to be. Uh, she just felt she had a different role, and that when they came to her house, uh, they were really supposed to enjoy it, even if they went past boundaries that I had and that Shirley had set at home. Uh, what do you think about grandparents disciplining? And you think there ought to be a little permissive? Well, I think there ought to be rules of the grandparents' home, and I think they ought to be kept. And uh, frankly, we, at least we do that. And uh, I talk to others who think it's wise, too. We just simply lay out the ground rules of what things are, are permissible at our home, and they know what things are permissible at theirs. But we work by our rules when they're in our house. And uh, they don't seem to have any problem with it because they know pretty carefully uh, what we expect. How about for grandparents who do have a problem uh, where there is you know, a confrontation where there are discipline problems, there well, is disrespect. How far can they go? Well, I just don't think it's wise to allow them to go uh, very far with that. And I think uh, a lot of grandparents make a mistake of saying, well, we've got two sets of grandparents, the in-laws and us, and we're going to be the fun ones. And the others are going to be, you know, we're going to yeah. we're going to be the most fun ones. We're going to take them more places, spend more money, let them have more, so they'll like us better than the others. I think there's a, a certain level of immaturity there. 
that uh, can really harm kids pretty severely. I think uh, grandparents ought to stick by their guns and, and pretty much uh, grandparent like they parented, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think it will, will pay off. Generally, the grandparents who say the kids don't behave as well when the parents arrive are grandparents who run a tight ship. <laughs> and uh, they, find that they find that that tight ship works fine until the parents yeah. come, and then they push the edges because the parents aren't quite sure where they're at, so the kid will push and push and push until he finds out mm-hmm. you know, where the edge is. Grandchildren, I think, very often, what, at least in the reports I get, what they tend to do is the grandparents say, well, my dad doesn't understand me, or my dad's too strict, or, or my dad wouldn't let me go to this or that, or my dad did this. And the grandparent, rather than saying, oh, well, yeah, you do have one of those bad parents or whatever, you know, I'm a nice guy, needs to help interpret the parent to yeah. the child. Now, do you ever understand why your dad says that? I mean, why mm-hmm. do you suppose he does that? What has he got in mind, really? Uh, is it because he loves you? You know, well, mm-hmm. yeah. well, would you rather be overloved or underloved? You know, mm-hmm. he's only trying <laughs> to do his best. You know, he never did this before. Right. You know, uh, this is my son. I happen to know he never did this before. You're the first kid 16 he ever had. And so he's doing his very best and, you know, trying to explain. Mom's not just trying to wreck your good time, but mom loves you supremely. You describe that interpreting role of grandparents in the book. I think that's one of the most important concepts there uh, of attempting to put oil on troubled waters and and explain one side to the other. Sometimes you have to explain to parents what the teenager is feeling. Yes, I think very much, and, and especially when they're trying to make the kids perfect for your benefit as yeah. a grandparent, to uh, back the thing off a couple of clicks and say, hey, I think the kids are very fine. They're doing very well. You don't have to impress us with this. We know they have their good times and their bad times. You know, you can't have them all, you know, spit and polish, standing there at attention all the time for the grandparents. Grandparents, uh, you know, mm-hmm. have to be given a little credit, too. They, they understand some things. Jay, with so many families disintegrating and so many, uh, you know, divorces occurring today, what is the role of the grandparent when a family's breaking up? Well, it's it's very difficult, of course, to uh, not take sides, to not side with your child versus the in-law, that kind of thing. I've had amazing number of letters about this. The toughest one today, of course, is custody. I mean, you have people who have been bonded to a grandchild for six, seven years, and then the parents get a divorce, and that grandchild is taken off. Say you're the, in the most cases, this would be where you're the grandparent, the father of the Mm -hmm. son, and then the children get taken to another part of the country, and then the court intervenes, and can you write or can you have contact? And there are, of course, national organizations now set up to deal with the courts and all with this, but it's one of the saddest things, and I encourage grandparents to attempt as best they can not to take sides, uh, try to offer love and acceptance to everybody, um, attempt to keep contact with the grandchildren, even if they can only do it through cards and letters. Don't overdo the gift thing and try to buy them back or something like that. Uh, Let them know you're there, uh, something solid in their lives. I've even gone so far as to encourage that you uh, make your house kind of a predictable place. Grandma's Mm -hmm. house has a certain smell to it. Uh, Things, (laughs) furniture looks the same. Things are sitting in the same places. When these kids' lives start coming unglued, they they need need something something that's pretty predictable. Uh, I encourage them about holidays and all, that if they'll start very young, insisting that the grandchildren be there on on holidays and they get some rituals, some fun stuff going, then later when the thing comes unglued, the kid naturally will hark back to that and seek Mm. that. And I have some wonderful testimonials of this kind of thing. You know, my mother uh, had stocked her house with stuff for our kids. Mm -hmm. There was this little box of of, um, baubles and Mm -hmm. and, uh, pearls and things that Danae just loved. And Mm -hmm. the moment she would walk through that front door, she'd run for that box. You know, Mm -hmm. my mom had all kinds of stuff for Danae and Ryan there, which made coming to her house so much fun. It doesn't uh, have to be all new stuff either. Sometimes it's that toy box full of all that junk they dump on the kitchen floor. Yeah. She wades around through it while she's fixing dinner. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, you know, I have people 60 years old writing about their grandparents saying this is the thing they remember. I, uh, one of the common themes was grandmas tend to be the person who lets you bake the cookies without making you uh, uh, feel inept. They mm. let you actually do it. They, they let you stir it and <laughs> yeah. put it in and do everything. And Lick the pan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the boys say, grandpa actually doesn't take the wrench out of my mm. hand. Mm. <laughs> that was a, a theme, wrench or screwdriver, whatever. Uh, grandpa lets you pedal with it. He doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't act like you're going to ruin the whole world. One of the things that came through this, uh, this survey was grandpa lets me take things apart. 
apparently it's a fairly common thing for grandfathers in, mm -hmm. in Indiana anyway to say to a boy, here's a, a motor or a television, or something. here's a bunch of screws. You can take this thing apart, you know. And they just seem to love it. It's the best toy in the world, you know, mm -hmm. to, to take something apart, you know, get inside and mm -hmm. figure what it's all about. And they, they think grandpas let you do things like that. It's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. My grandfathers were older. When two of them, uh, the grandfather and great-grandfather, had died before I came on the scene, and my other grandfather was 80 years old. So I don't relate a whole lot. I didn't experience it. Uh, but uh, grandmothers I know a lot about because they had a great <laughs> impact on my life, and especially spiritually, as I said earlier. Uh, how can a grandmother or grandfather go about conveying the most important thing in life to little kids, putting it into their language. Uh, and I don't even know how my grandmothers did it so well, but I mean, they really did communicate to me that this was important to me. Well, one thing that almost universally, and this may just be generational and the fact that grandmothers don't know how to run the VCR, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> grandparents apparently do more reading than parents today. And reading is a very intimate thing, to sit with a child, the body warmth, them curled somewhere near you while grandmother reads and talks to you about things. Um, and somehow or another, I think also this idea of God, the heavenly grandfather, is even more convincing mm -hmm. to kids, you know. I know uh, our uh, grandson, my oldest grandson, once we're driving down the driveway, and just out of the blue, he said, Grandpa, if the world got blown up by a hydrogen bomb, do you think God could put it back together again? Mm -hmm. And I said, well... Uh, he did it the first time, didn't he? And he said, yeah. Well, we drove just a little farther, and he starts singing. He's got the whole world in his hand. And then he had, mm -hmm. he's got you and me in his hand. He had mom and dad in his hand. He had his sisters in his hand. He went through every human being that I know that he knew intimately at the time in his hand. And it just seemed mm -hmm. to settle it, you know. Yeah. And I thought, well, why mm -hmm. just because I said it? But then I'm kind of the authority around, you know. I'm mm -hmm. the patriarch of our little clan, and I'm about as old as you get, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, God must be old like that, too. And I think that grandparents can, by talking and affirming, you know, to them, listening is, was a big thing ran through this thing, too. Grandparents tend to listen. Uh, yeah, yeah not, not feel they've got to give an answer right now. There is a time in child development when those kinds of issues yeah. are very interesting to them. Yeah. I mean, if you don't capture those opportunities, then when they're 14 and 16 and 18, it's sometimes very difficult to make up for lost time. Well, it? you know, another thing I, I try to do toward the end of the book is to talk about the role of the aging grandparent with dealing with mortality. Um, it's one of my biases, at least, that we've attempted to take uh, death and all out of culture. People don't die, they pass away. Uh, many uh, kids have never been to a funeral. We have college students who have never been to a funeral. In fact, one of the large things I face with college students is the death of their grandparent. It's a huge thing. It's a major event on a college mm -hmm. campus. Grandparents die, and it's a very major thing to these kids. And I've tried to encourage grandparents to, to deal with mortality. When the, you know something comes up about death, and, and maybe the grandparent says something about it, and then the child, oh, well, you'll never die. Oh, yes, we will. Yes, we will, and, oh. and I'm ready for that. And a yeah. chance to give your testimony and tell about how you found the Lord and talk about the peace that passes all understanding. I've always said there's nothing quite so unconvincing as a whining missionary. You know, you go overseas, <laughs> meet a whining missionary. And there's nothing quite so unconvincing as a whining we'll grandparent mail on either. That, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, you meet some noble, wonderful missionaries, but you meet some whiners too, and it's pretty unconvincing stuff. But you meet a, a grandparent who is whining about old age. Everything is bad. The uh, world's turning bad on them, sickness, everything. All they talk about is misery and all, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, God having prepared us for this experience. And, uh, we're going to be with him someday, and, and uh, old things will pass away and all things become new. Uh, I uh, actually have uh, sat with numbers of people who've moved off into eternity as uh, committed Christians who did it well. I think mm -hmm. it would be a good thing for grandparents to try to do well, grow old well. One probably doesn't need to unbutton a couple buttons on his shirt and get a gold chain and trade in his, <laughs> you know, his, uh, what do they say, 40-year-old wife for 220s and then find out they're not wired for 220 and all that. Uh, you know, uh, this whole Old idea of, yeah, go, yeah, 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 go back. Uh, but to really do it with <laughs> dignity, I think kids uh, respect this and they need it from grandparents. I think that's what my grandmothers did for me. They yeah. talked a lot about heaven. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. No. Ministers today talk about getting through tomorrow and yeah. capturing the power of God for more successful living <laughs> and all that stuff, Therapy. prosperity. Yeah. Uh, and man, they talked 
in those days about a few more years to carry on, and then I'm going to see Jesus. And they translated that to me as a four, five, or six-year-old in a way that made me want to go there. Well, in a way, it's the theme of the Old Testament. God was faithful throughout history, therefore He'll be faithful to you in the future. A grandparent who can tell a young person about their own youth, about God's faithfulness in their life, the vicissitudes of their life, the things they went through that were painful and struggling, and yet they now they've arrived at old age uh, happy with what God has given them. They don't have regrets and so on. This is very important stuff. It teaches more about sovereignty than all of theology in the world, really. <laughs> yeah. I think you're kind of enjoying this role, Jay. I am. I, I am. And, and the thing that I'm enjoying most is the realization that it's a live, real function. I, I even take the time in this book to get into the kind of the heritage of it, the, the thought of uh, uh, assuring their education, for instance. Hmm. Uh, you know, when you think about it, I think about our kids and our nine grandchildren, will they be able to afford to educate their, our grandchildren? And if I can participate in some way in that process, I'll be, feel hmm. very good to be able to provide Christian education, for instance, uh, as opposed to saying, well, I need one more trip to wherever. I'm not sure I do. Does that actually hmm. affect your spending decisions today? Absolutely. You know, you pass on money to your children about the time they don't need it. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, grandchildren and their education and all, and I think you can direct some of it that way. Infliction mm -hmm. does move along. You know, it's, it's fun. Yeah. But when you look at it in raw numbers, it's, it's really frightening. And yeah. at some point, the rag will hit the gears. And I think grandparents can think about that, do something about it, as opposed to saying, well, let's, uh, let's just blow this somewhere, you know. I drove with a grandparent out here in the airplane who's going to Las Vegas for Christmas. Well, I'm uh, not sure that's where I'd like to spend Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you deal uh, in your book uh, with what you call surrogate grandparenting. You need to explain what that well, is. Well, what I've found is that there are a great many lonely grandparents, really, in our churches whose families have dispersed across the country. You know, the grandchildren live in Philadelphia and they live in California or whatever. And uh, yet the church also, because that same thing, has a lot of little nuclear families in it where there are families whose grandparents live a long distance away mm -hmm. or single parent families. And one thing I found very effective is grandparents who kind of adopt little families and become surrogate grandparents. You know, uh, come to our house on uh, Easter or come to our house on Thanksgiving. You're not going to be able to go to Philadelphia. Come to our house. And I found that this uh, grandma and grandpa, whatever, uh, in the church is a wonderful function and gives many grandparents a great sense of belonging and sense of uh, well-being, a sense of accomplishment and contribution. In fact, especially maybe with some of these little families with a single parent, mm -hmm. totally cut off, they're the only human in the world, you know, and to yeah. be able to come to someone's house and to get in a family configuration, that is powerful, powerful stuff. And do some mentoring for them. Uh, you Absolutely. know, uh, grandparents who are uh, perhaps located a long ways from their kids are often the most underutilized people yeah. around because they've got 20 years of experience yeah. in parenting and they're no longer fulfilling that role. Don't just sit in the back pew. Invite them to the house and you'll find they'll come. They'll want to come. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. I have a lot of data to show. So. And you know what? The kids fall in love with them too. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have and to be in the family for <laughs> kids to fall in love with you. That's so. right. And some of them really do not have any other known grandparent. And so you end up being a lifelong grandparent. And that's a special blessing to certain people. You're listening to Family Talk, and that was part two of Dr. Dobson's classic conversation with Dr. Jay Kessler on the topic of grandparenting. What an encouraging and poignant reminder of the value and influence of older generations in a child's life here on today's installment of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Proverbs 1631 says, Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Grandparents and older adults are in a unique position to pour wisdom, grace, and love into younger generations. So today, why not take a moment to ask God to show you how you can begin encouraging your grandchildren. Now, to hear any part of today's program that you might have missed, visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. Or give us a call at 877-732-6825. We have team members available around the clock to take your call. 
Now, before we go, I want to tell you about a special campaign that we are supporting here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. As Easter quickly approaches, wouldn't it be great if there was an easy way to introduce people in your community to Jesus Christ, to have an opportunity that isn't confrontational and is also a blessing to them as well? Well, that's exactly what we're providing with our new Life Baskets initiative. Here's how it works. First, Pray for God to put a person, or maybe a family, on your heart who he would like you to share the gospel with. It could be a neighbor, co-worker, or maybe someone else in your life. Then take a simple basket and load it up with treats and other goodies for that person or family to whom you are led. Add an invitation to your church's Easter services, along with a small Bible and a gospel tract, and then finally take it to that person and then watch the Lord go to work. For more information on how to create a life basket and also helpful links for what to put in it, go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash life basket. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash the word life and the word basket. We can't wait to see what God does. Well, we've come to the end of our time on today's edition of Family Talk. Please join us again tomorrow for the third and final installment of Dr. Dobson's important conversation with Dr. Jay Kessler on the topic of the high call of grandparenting. Thanks again for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family today and every day. Join us again next time for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.